monitoring health and safety. Uh, today, I took a, a topic, a topic of uh, sharing with you uh, about quartz crystal resonators. Uh, um, a lot of people uh, know crystals as basically crystals used in chandeliers. Uh, and uh, some people have info, you know, knowledge about crystals being used in watches and clocks. Uh, but by and far, a lot of people don't know about crystals. Uh, the reason being there's not very many crystal manufacturers in the world. Uh, it's a very uh, niche industry uh, uh, catering uh, to a very specified, specialized specified field. And uh, uh, most of the manufacturers are located in North America, uh, which is US. Uh, Canada, we are the only main uh, manufacturers. Uh, there's another small company here in Canada. Uh, Europe has some other companies uh, which are making uh, crystal resonators and oscillators. Uh, uh, China has started to make a lot of crystals mm -hmm. now, uh, pretty primarily quartz. They're growing quartz. They're um, making uh, uh, quartz crystals and they're also finishing crystals, uh, uh, but they're more on the commercial side. So talking about quartz crystals, uh, basically crystals are primarily two kinds of uh, ma major applications of crystals. Uh, one is precision, uh, which is high precision, high reliability um, uh, crystals used in very high tech equipment and environment. And then there's commercial grade crystals. Uh, I'll share uh, some of the applications and uh, a little bit in a slide uh, later. Um, I'm primarily working for a company which is making uh, quartz crystal resonators, which are used for frequency and timing uh, applications in a very precision market. So we are making precision crystals, which are used in uh, a telecom industry, um, uh, which are used in uh, uh, aerospace uh, defense, uh, space satellite equipment, uh, some medical applications, uh, et cetera. I'll start off with talking about a little bit about quartz. So what exactly is quartz? So quartz is a material which is known to possess following combination of properties. Piezoelectric, which is pressure electric, piercing coming from the Greek word uh, press. Uh, it has a zero temperature coefficient cut. Uh, it's stress compensated. It's got a very high Q, means very low losses. It's easy to process. It's very soluble. Uh, it's got sorry low solubility and it's a very hard material and uh, however it it can be dissolved in fluoride agents uh, uh, it's found abundance in nature and it's easy to grow uh, with high purity and perfection so piezo comes from the greek word piezo and meaning to press and piezo electricity is described as electricity electrical polarity due to pressure especially in crystalline substance so uh, Basically, it's, it's, we can say that it's an electrical charge produced on a quartz surface uh, when they are distorted or subjected to pressure. Uh, so quartz material will distort and produce mechanical vibration when an alternate current is uh, applied to it. Uh, the next slide shows you how a crystal lattice looks like. Uh, uh, this is the picture on the left side is a deformed lattice and uh, the picture on the right side is a strained lattice. So uh, basically, you can see that a coupling is formed when mechanical uh, between the mechanical properties of a crystal uh, and an electrical circuit when a drive is given to it. Uh, th this is how a typical crystal looks like, a crystal package. Uh, and basically, a uh, crystal package is, uh, there are only three components in the crystal, um, uh, which is the main component being the quartz, uh, which is uh, uh, processed uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, the electrodes are formed on or deposited on the quartz. Then they're mounted on a mounting structure, which we call a base. And then the can is put on top and sealed. And this is how different crystals look like. And based on different applications, the crystals can be to different uh, uh, sizes. Uh, um, you know, the surface mount packages, or there's vertical mount packages, or there's circular round TO8 kind of packages. So uh, in general, what we can say is the quartz is one of the form of uh, uh, several forms of silicon dioxide, which is found in uh, nature. Um, uh, we know that the earth crust has so much uh, of silicon dioxide, but the electronic grade uh, of quartz is very rare. Now, uh, back in the 1920s, 30s or earlier, um, man was using only uh, natural uh, quartz, which was available. 
but since after the second world war um, uh, the humans started to make their own uh, quartz uh, and it replaced the natural quartz so how is man made quartz made uh, Cultured quartz is produced by placing small chips of quartz in an autoclave or pressure chamber mixed with an aqueous alkaline solution. Now, this solution is then subjected to a very high temperature of 350 degrees C, 12,500 psi, causing the quartz to dissolve and eventually reform around the seeds, which is we call an autoclave. So this process takes about 30 to 45 days, depending upon the size and the type of the quartz bar used. Culture quartz have now completely replaced her natural quartz in finished crystals. So, so quartz basically used because it's got ex excellent mechanical, thermal, and chemical properties. It's got a very high Q, very low losses, and it's got ex excellent stability. Talking about some of the applications of quartz crystals, um, military and aerospace, these are very precision and high reliability applications communication, navigation, radar systems, sensors, guidance systems, electronic warfare, uh, research and metrology, which is atomic clocks, instruments, astronomy, space tracking, celestial navigation. Consumer, which be more like uh, commercial crystals, they are used in watches and clocks, cell phones, pagers, radio hi-fi equipment, cable color TVs, uh, toys and games. You know, even the cars have crystals, like you'll see a, uh, you know, remote control car with having a 27 mega, megahertz crystal. Um, those are commercial grade crystals. Certain automotive uh, um, crystals, the crystals used in the automotive industry now too, uh, they're also pretty much commercial grade. Various industrial applications, which is again, high reliability, which is communications, cell phone base stations, um, mobile, um, aviation, avionics, navigation, instrumentation, uh, certain applications in modems and sensors. Okay, so how is quartz basically fabricated? I'm just gonna go into detail. It's a process driven industry which involves various different processes. I'm gonna go in brief for how this process runs. Uh, so um, the, the, the very first thing which is done is the design and the design engineer does a design based on the crystal specifications. So once the design is done, uh, you have to select your quartz and the quartz uh, uh, you'll go you'll, you'll use a sweeping uh, bar which you've grown uh, then you'll cut uh, uh, cutting is important because uh, you got to cut crystals um, from the bar and uh, when when you cut crystals from the bar you cut at various specified angles because um, uh, uh, and I'll show you what happens and how it's done a little later. Uh, then after the quartz is cut, um, uh, it's in a very uh, rough stage. So you have to lap uh, quartz uh, and you use various abrasive compounds to lap it uh, from a rough lapping to fine lapping stages. Uh, now, when the quartz is cut, it's formed in the form of a sphere and then you put subject to a grinding wheel to give it a round shape because that's how the typically quartz used uh, uh, in a structure. Once uh, we round the quartz, uh, we have to determine the angle because uh, there's three planes uh, of axis, uh, X, Y, and Z. So when you cut your quartz, you have to determine um, what is the angle uh, uh, of your cut. And the reason this angle is important because it has a, a characteristic correlation between the turning point of the quartz, which is one of the emotional parameters being measured uh, uh, during time of test. Now, sometimes the angle is not correct and there's a process where we can correct the angle. Uh, we sometimes also uh, put um, uh, a contour or a curvature to the quartz, uh, like you can, you've seen in, the, uh, in lenses, uh, how the curvature is there. Uh, and the reason why it's done in the quartz is basically to trap the energy in the center of the quartz. Uh, the quartz is then subjected to various chemical and uh, uh, um, mechanically polished uh, operations just to uh, finish it. Uh, and then it's subjected to aggressive cleaning. The cleaning is a very important feature uh, uh, for a quartz because uh, when you're using abrasives and chemical actions, you want to make sure uh, all the particles are completely removed and there's no uh, particles or uh, contamination uh, left in, in the, on the quartz surface or in the pores of the quartz. Um, finally, once the cleaning is done, um, uh, what we want to do is uh, form electrodes on the quartz for conductivity. So a quartz surface has two, uh, a quartz crystal has two surfaces, uh, uh, the top and the bottom. So an electrode is formed on both the sides of the crystal, which we call by a process called uh, 
base plating. And what you do is uh, 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 you use a certain mask uh, and uh, by certain processes like thermo evaporative uh, plating processes or uh, E-beam method of plating processes, you develop the electrodes on the crystal. Um, I also want to say that uh, there's a very direct correlation between the thickness and the frequency of the crystal. Uh, and, and the correlation is that the thickness is inversely proportional to the fre uh, fre uh, frequency or frequency is inversely proportional to the thickness. So as we keep changing the thickness of the quartz by lamping or by polishing or by capping uh, etching, we are increasing the frequency. So we start off with a certain frequency and we know what our target is. So at every stage of the process, we are changing the thickness and in, in reality, we are changing the frequency and we keep measuring that frequency as we keep going. Uh, once the electrode is deposited, uh, then we want to prepare the uh, uh, quartz crystal to mount it on a surface. The mounting structure basically has few ribbons and it's uh, the quartz crystal is put in between those ribbons and uh, cemented or bonded using certain type of epoxy paste. Uh, then it is cured subject to aggressive curing. Curing is basically subjecting the crystal to various high temperature profiles uh, to cure the bonded uh, paste uh, and to uh, uh, so that it's uh, it's finished uh, and it's fully cured and then it's inspected inspection again very important feature because you want to uh, inspect your quartz to not have any defects so while processing a lot of defects get formed in the quartz which could be in the form of uh, chips scratches uh, uh, when the quartz is grown, there could be certain type of defects while growing, which is inclusions uh, and um, uh, uh, there are surface defects like pits, uh, which can happen at the time of growth or the, there could be for pits created as a result of chemical etching or polishing. So we inspect those for all those defects based on certain internal standards and military standards and uh, we separate the good part from the bad parts and we continue. Uh, once the um, uh, good parts are separated uh, from the bad parts, uh, we may do a final clean depending upon the application of the metal being used. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to mention that when we talked about the depositing uh, layer uh, of electrodes, uh, mainly gold is used, a pure, very pure form of gold is used as an electrode. There are certain other metals, metals uh, like aluminum, silver, uh, and nickel is also being used based on certain applications, but primarily we use gold. Uh, after the uh, uh, cleaning is final cleaning and inspection is done, uh, the parts are then uh, subjected to the final frequency adjust, which is fi final plating process or frequency adjustment process. Because base plating brings the crystals to a certain level of the frequency to your actual desired frequency, it's not it's not there yet. So final frequency adjustment is done on every single crystal individually to bring it to that frequency. So let's say we are making a hundred megahertz fifth over tone crystal. Uh, we will uh, we'll plate each crystal till it reaches hundred megahertz with a certain amount of tolerance required uh, or given as per the specification. And then uh, we'll finish it and seal it. Sealing is basically, uh, we are using a, a resistance weld or cold weld uh, uh, procedures to seal or putting the can on the crystal. And then it's subjected to testing. Testing uh, is, uh, is basically on various parameters and uh, most part of the most part of the time is taken in testing. So quartz crystal cuts, uh, as I was talking, uh, uh, this is a, a image shows you uh, what a basically uh, a, a crystal looks like, uh, a bar looks like, which is a form of a prism uh, and it's got three axes, X, Y, and Z axis. Um, it is uh, necessary to choose the reference direction within the crystals in order to specify the values of these physical properties. So the directions uh, are the three same X, Y, and Z axis. So crystals have temperature versus frequency characteristics. So hence different cut crystals are uh, used based on different requirements. So when, uh, as I was saying, there are different types of crystal bars when they are actually grown. Uh, and the crystal is cut based on the axis. There are certain kinds of crystals which come, which are called AT cut, which are singly rotated crystals, and certain other type of cuts which are called SC cuts, which are doubly rotated crystals. Means they have two two planes of rotation, and a single uh, singly rotated crystals have single plane of rotation. Um, I'm going to just talk about now a few terms which are used in the crystal oscillator industry. Um, so, uh, before I talk about that, uh, uh, as I sh earlier showed you the picture of the crystals, the crystals are uh, 
uh, used for frequency control and timing purposes, but they are used in an oscillator. Uh, so our primary customers are the companies which are making oscillators and then uh, uh, they buy the crystal from us, they put it in the oscillator and then the oscillators are sell, sold to uh, the big companies who are making big modules or uh, big equipment or uh, depending upon the application. Uh, some of the companies I would like to mention that uh, when we're making crystals, uh, high liability or uh, uh, very pre precision crystals, uh, uh, the, the companies uh, like Lockheed Martin, uh, uh, companies like, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, which are making defense and satellite equipment. Uh, then there's uh, uh, various other companies which are making uh, uh, um, products or crystal oscillators for Boeing and stuff like that. Uh, they are our customers. So quartz naturally vibrate in several simultaneously resonance modes referred to as the fundamental or overtone modes. Uh, usually one of these modes is designed to be dominant at the desired operating frequency. So overtone mode occurs at odd number of harmonics or the fundamental mode uh, and include third, fifth, seventh, and, and eleventh harmonics. So basically a fundamental crystal is the first overtone and then we have third overtone, fifth overtone, seventh overtone, nine overtone. So I can measure uh, each crystal uh, on these overtone frequencies and uh, the reason being uh, based on design specific or customer uh, specific requirements, uh, certain types of overtones are taken uh, as desired by the customer. So this is how a typical crystal looks like uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a circuit uh, element uh, where L1, C1, R1 are the, basically the motional parameters of the crystal. Uh, the mechanical elasticity of the quartz is represented as a motional capacitor C1 and the mechanical losses of the crystal appear as an equivalent series of resistance uh, R1. The electrodes uh, which I talked about earlier plated on the crystal form a parallel plate capacitor with quartz as dielectric. This combined with stray capacitance from the crystal holder creates static capacitance C0. CL is the load capacitance of the circuit. Crystals operate as specific load capacitance, which is defined by the customer for parallel load applications. So we could have a parallel or series resonant operation depending upon the requirements. So parallel uh, resonant frequency is FL, uh, which is at load and series resonant frequency is at FR. So we will take each into consideration depending upon the customer specification. Pullability. The pullability of the crystal describes how uh, the operating frequency may be changed by varying the load capacitance. The pullability specifications helps you decide how much trimming will be required to compensate for circuit component variations. This is very important because um, um, we are designing the crystal and making the crystal to go in a crystal oscillator. And um, uh, the crystal needs to have pullability char characteristics so that when the customer puts the crystal in their oscillator, they can fine tune it. Frequency stability. Uh, so this is typ typical how a crystal oscillator looks like. Uh, uh, we have a tuning voltage, uh, which is applied to a crystal resonator. There's an amplifier and then it gives an output frequency. So overall frequency stability of a crystal oscillator is depending upon the stability of uh, the parameters which includes the crystal circuit. Long-term stability. This is most important feature of crystal characteristics, uh, which you call as aging. Uh, so in terms, uh, what we can say is that the frequency stability of a crystal over an extended period of time is usually expressed, expressed in parts per million or parts per billion per day or per year. So aging is a general term applying to any cumulative process which contributes to the deterioration of the crystal unit and which results in gradual change of its characteristic. Um, so when we make a 100 megahertz fifth overtone crystal, we have a certain design specification or tolerance given by the uh, sorry, design tolerance given by the customer. So uh, a customer would typically give a design tolerance on a 100 meg fifth overtone crystal as plus or minus five ppm. So plus 500 hertz to minus 500 hertz deviation is allowed. Uh, a customer expects that a crystal, um, uh, when a drive is given to the crystal uh, and crystal oscillate, it should reach 100 max right away and it should be stable at that 100 max within that tolerance or the aging of the crystal or the deviation of the frequency should be very minimum. Uh, typical aging of a resistance weld parts is two PPM per year and typical aging of a cold weld part should be one to one and a half PPM per year. Now there's various factors which influence the crystal aging uh, uh, and can deteriorate the crystal aging which could be 
minute leakage in the packet holder when the crystal is hermetically sealed. And if there's a, a small leakage, uh, that would over a period of time can cause deterioration in the frequency aging of the crystal. Adsorption of the crystal, very corrosion of the electrodes, irreversible changes in crystal lattice, outgassing of materials or presence of contamination or other mounting stresses. Phase noise. Phase noise is, uh, is a very widely term used in crystal industry uh, and it's a very important term uh, and it's used to describe the instability in the phase or frequency of a crystal unit in periods of time in few seconds or less. It is measured as a ratio of power in the noise to that in the carrier at a specified offset frequency in a specified bandwidth. So the phase noise characteristic of a crystal is very important for it. It was intended to be used in crystal oscillators for applications like radar and navigation, communication, RF, and test, uh, test and measurement equipment. Vibration sensitivity, which we also call a G-sense. Vibration sensitivity, sensitivity or G-sensitivity refers to the degradation of the flows in noise performance of crystal resonator under the influence of external mechanical properties. Phase noise of other quiet crystal resonators can be significantly degraded when the crystal is operated in environments such as fixed or rotary wing aircraft, ships, missiles, application, another application where quartz plank is excited by mechanical vibration. Uh, th this next slide shows you uh, basically a quartz crystal, uh, how uh, an electrode is deposited uh, on both the sides of the crystal. Um, and the, the two pictures below, uh, the one on the left hand side shows a surface mount crystal package. Um, and the picture on the right shows you uh, uh, like a typical T08 uh, round uh, package, uh, crystal resonator. To represent uh, or give a per perspective, uh, uh, this is a two mount pocket uh, package and a three or a four point mount package. So uh, talking about how a crystal uh, looks like uh, we, we have a, a crystal uh, which is mounted uh, on a base which shows the mounting clips. They're bonded and cemented where the electrode is. Uh, then uh, uh, this is a base uh, and the ribbon is suspended on the base which has and the connected to the two pins and the pins go on the printed circuit board. And uh, the can is uh, used and it's hermetically sealed. Uh, the same thing happens on a round package, which could be a three or a four point mount package. Testing crystal resonators are tested for various motional parameters once finished. Um, this uh, is based on, again, the requirements uh, uh, from the customer to specification they want to meet. Uh, typically, uh, they are tested for frequency, which is these series or low resonant frequency, motional capacitance, resistance C1, RS, uh, phase noise, turn point, angle, drive level dependency, which is DLD, and G sensitivity. High reliability crystals require extensive test testing, which use, includes environmental and reliability tests, aging tests, various cleaning tests, vibration testing. Uh, some of the testing for very high reliability crystals can take up to three or four months time. So just imagine, uh, you know, uh, sometimes how, could, how much could be the lead time on a crystal being made for certain specified application. Most of the crystal for uh, you know, uh, standard purposes um, have a 12 to 14 week or 10 week lead time total from the point of manufacture and testing uh, and uh, by the time it reaches customer. But certain high reliability crystals can go up to three or four months of testing. Scientific research and experimental development. So design and, and manufacture of crystals is very technical requiring advanced engineering staff and techniques. In order to improve quality and yield, we constantly experiment and develop crystals, manufacturing processes, materials, and products in chrome and crystals. In Canada, we have become recognized as the research and development center for precision crystals. Hence, SRED is a program is very important to us. So we do a lot of research and development, and uh, uh, we do uh, um, record uh, and uh, write-ups but we don't share it or uh, we don't publish it because it's a very competitive industry and uh, you want to keep your own secrets. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, um, the technology of crystals, uh, uh, it's not changing very much, but there is very, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty and um, unknown variables. So we are constantly evaluating them uh, and constantly trying to uh, evolve 
uh, and improve on things by doing the research and development. Uh, in Canada, we have a, uh, okay. a very good program by the government. <laughs> And uh, they do a lot of funding for scientific research and uh, experimental development, uh, which is being used by the manufacturing organizations. So uh, it's very favorable. They they fund fund uh, fund the scientific research and experimental development. So we can use uh, um, all that money or write off that money, which is being used towards uh, SR and media every year when we do our taxes. So this is a nutshell. Uh, basically, I you know uh, how crystal industry works like. Uh, if you guys have any questions, certainly I'll be more than happy to answer them. So we shall prevail here. One question on the crystals. Of course, it's a very specialized uh, field. Uh, uh, but I heard that uh, crystals are also used in uh, high quality musical instruments too, which creates a you know, musical thing and you know, in a very different league. So is it those crystals, if those are being used in those equipment, they are called, they are high grade or they are commercial grade typically? No, when it comes to musical instruments or watches or uh, um, cell phones, pagers, they're all more or less commercial grade crystals because um, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, uh, the, the requirements uh, required for those type of crystals is, uh, uh, not very stringent or, uh, you know, they're supposed to work in a module or in, and the, the, they can have certain types of variations or uh, there's, uh, uh, they, they, they're not supposed to, the, they're not in a very complicated oscillator circuit, I, sh I should say. Uh, what happens in a precision, uh, they are in a very complicated oscillator circuit uh, where there's so many, many specifications they have to meet. So what happens is when we, uh, in a typical crystal, when we make um, uh, uh, our yield uh, for the final product from the start to finish, if we calculate the cumulative yield is about 70%. And you'll say that that's very poor, but, but that's very good because um, what happens is um, when, we, when we test the crystal, uh, it has to meet so many parameters uh, and every parameter has uh, limitations and it, it needs to fulfill all those requirements or param parameters. So uh, there's this fallout for various reasons at various stages uh, of testing. So uh, uh, when it comes to uh, certain commercial grade uh, equipments uh, or there is the stringent, the, the behavior of the crystal oscillator is not um, very uh, precision or uh, doesn't require very high uh, requirements uh, to perform. So. Uh, in those kind of instruments and in, uh, you know a crystal could have a, a very open uh, you know range of uh, performance and it will still perform properly but when it comes to um, uh, certain crystal oscillators which are we make it for uh, you know navigation systems or uh, satellite equipment like i'll give you an ex some examples like um, for example uh, uh, when uh, there was the iraq war uh, we made a crystal for tow missile they used uh, the U.S. defense used um, missiles, which were called tow missile. All the crystals were made by us. So the crystals going in a missile, right? So see how how much uh, specifications or how stringent specifications uh, they would be to for a crystal to perform in a missile uh, meet all those requirements. Then they use cell phone jammers. So the crystal were designed um, and made by us. So the Mars ro rover, if you remember, 2003, 2004, uh, the first rover which went to Mars. It had the crystal made by us. So, you know, when it comes to that specifications uh, and that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, equipment or uh, the specifications or performance of a crystal is tested towards various, various parameters. And it becomes extremely difficult to meet all those specifications. And one thing is a uh, crystal performing in an oscillator and then the oscillator goes in the another module or another uh, component and you know, henceforth it's tested. So that's pretty much it. I hope I, I so, so if, which means, is there any, there is no common parameters based on which you can qualify that below this level, it is uh, commercial grade and above this grade uh, level, it bo goes very high quality factor what you fall in. Well, uh, okay. So I, I, I'll say it's not like that. Uh, it's more or less like, so for example, if a customer specification comes to me, 
uh, and we have to design a crystal, uh, which is say, uh, the customer wants a 20 megahertz fundamental crystal. And he has given a frequency tolerance of 100 ppm. Um, there is no spe specification for most of capacitance. There's no specification for phase noise. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and, and the customer says that, okay, the, uh, at a 20 megahertz crystal, I need a resistance of say about, uh, you know, 25 ohms maximum. So, uh, you know, it, it's a very open and easy specification. All we have to do is um, make the crystal, uh, the, uh, the frequency specification is wide open. Uh, the resistance pack is very easy and there's no other specification. So that's a very simple commercial crystal. So we'll make it a, a, a very simple design for it. But then if a customer, uh, if a specification comes from Boeing and they want it for a space uh, a flight model, um, which has uh, the, the specification itself is 100 pages long or one for one product. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are some specification, I'll tell you, uh, uh, we, in our company, we have a, a, a specification which fall under ITAR. Uh, it's a term used in North America, North America. And those specifications, I cannot even look. I cannot even see customer drawing, uh, drawings being an employee of the country, of the company still, because uh, ITAR, there are only certain specified people who have to be for, uh, qualified by our ITAR. There's background checks. There's so many checks they're done. And, uh, you know, then only you can see the specification. So usually in our company, there's two people or three people at the most qualified to see ITAR specification. I can work on the product, but I cannot open the customer drawing, you know? Uh, mm. So, so that's what I'm trying to say okay. is basically, you know, um, for, for applications like space and military, you know, uh, uh, when it comes from Boeing and companies like QTAC Corporation or Lockheed Martin, uh, you know, those, those customer specifications are like even, uh, you know, for one particular part are 100 pages long or, uh, and, you know. It so basically you're saying the complexity in, in the specifications makes it, uh, makes yes, a lot of because, variation. So there is no common parameter. It, it depends upon exactly, those kind of Exactly. Things. So they will lay, lay down every single parameter and they will lay down every So it becomes a multi-dimensional thing, means it is not one dimension, you have to see so many dimensions at the same time. Exactly, exactly. The, okay, so then it becomes yeah. complex. Sometimes, so. uh, you know, uh, doing an RFQ can take weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, you can well imagine. Uh, because you have to study. You have to study the cust uh, uh, customer specification and uh, then you have to call meeting among uh, the entire group. Uh, of engineers and to see that can we fulfill it from the design point of view, from the process point of view, and uh, you know from the testing point of view, because um, you know uh, it's uh, a yeah. lot of these customer specifications will say no changes allowed. It means yeah. if we've locked, uh -huh. if we've told the customer that this is how we are making this product and this is how we are testing it, we cannot change it. We are committed to it. We cannot make any changes. We cannot allow any deviations. Sometimes even customer says homogeneous lot means you start a product and if you have failure, uh, you cannot start a reorder. You cannot start another order to fulfill it. Uh, this, um, because most of these high liability uh, crystals at a certain stages in the process, couple of times we get inspectors from third party customer side, they come and look at the product uh, and approve it before we can continue further. So there's lots of complications and uh, complexities involved, uh, and we got to, you know, we have to make sure we look at every aspect of. Thank you, Vishal. It was it was a very different topic, but quite interesting. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. I I tried to keep it simple. I mean, I can go talking about these things, you know, but uh, then uh, you know, since if I use a lot of terms used in the industry, which are com common people, because see this. There's not even a single manufacturer, uh, crystal manufacturing company in India, right? No oscillator manufacturing, no crystal manufacturing. So a lot of people, um, the terminology used in this industry uh, in, uh, in some cases is catered to this industry. So I didn't want it to use a lot of those terms, but uh, I ended up using some. So please excuse me if you know it was a Vishal, very... can I ask a question? Because I'm still sure, not clear on some. Uh, how do you uh, convert the... How does the crystal vibrate and then get converted into this RCL circuit part of it? That's the crux I want to know. I want to okay. understand once more. Yes, sure, sir. So uh, as I said, sir, earlier, um, um, we first have a, a raw form of quartz, 
or we have a quartz wafer we can which we we can say which is silicon dioxide so we optically process it by lapping lapping it chemically etching it or polishing it and right. then we leave it at a certain frequency uh, because we can measure the frequency of the crystal uh, um, um, and uh, we we can leave the let's say we are making a 20 megahertz crystal uh, or a 100 megahertz fifth overtone crystal so we we have the design specification would tell us that okay at uh, the polishing stage after, which is the last stage before the finishing stage uh, where we are going to put the electrode now uh, the frequency has to be so many like say say 20.5 megahertz or something let's say so we leave the crystal at that frequency then we will put the electrodes on the crystal by electroplating process or the thermo evaporative process we will deposit uh, deposit electrodes so basically in a machine uh, we we have gold and the gold evaporates and then we have the mask masking the crystal and it, it uh, the unmasked area will form the electrode on the crystal Mm-hmm. Then what happens is we'll take this quartz wafer and then put it on a mounting structure. Uh, as I showed in this slide, okay, let me open this again. Uh, so we'll put it on a mounting structure. So now you can see that the electrode, the round, there's a round part of the electrode and then there's a, there's a, a flag part of the electrode. This flag part of the electrode is mounted on the uh, crystal uh, base or the ribbon. Uh, and then and the paste or the epoxy is applied to that uh, ribbon and the crystal. They're bonded together. So the connection is made. This is connected to the, the, the those pins or the leads. And these leads go on the printed circuit board or the PCB. So we have the flag on one side of the crystal and then there's another flag on the another side of the crystal which is connected to the other pin. So we have we have the two, the positive, and the negative, and then in some cases, they, in the three, third, three or the four point mount base or the circular package, we have the ground as well. So when, when a drive uh, is given to these pins, uh, so the crystals start um, oscillating. And because of oscillating and the piezoelectric effect, the mechanical, uh, because mechanical energy or vibration is converted into electrical energy. So, so the crystal, when the drive is given, crystal starts operate, operating. So if it's a 20 megahertz crystal we made, it will start oscillating at 20 megahertz. Uh, and um, uh, the importance of that would be that when it should oscillate at 20 megahertz uh, with the uh, aging uh, variation of, uh, or a frequency variation of one to one and a half PPM at the most. So if the, uh, and, and what happens is, um, um, uh, which I did not cover uh, because it would go too elaborate. When we uh, do the processing and we mounted the crystal, we cemented it, then we do bake. And after uh, when we seal the uh, her, the crystal hermetically by, by putting uh, having a vacuum inside it, or certain cases we do a helium backfill as well, depending upon the requirement. Then we subject it to excessive burn-in operations. Uh, this, these burn-in operation, the purpose of these burn-in operations or the oven operations is to uh, st- stabilize the stability of the crystal uh, or the frequency of the crystal. So, uh, which we call it uh, aging because um, burn- burning of the crystal will do a lot of outgassing of the epoxy or the, or the cement we used or any, any outgassing of the uh, inside the crystal package. And then after that outgassing is over, then the crystal will stabilize and uh, it would be a very, uh, uh, if, it, if we plot it frequency versus time curve, it would be a very flat curve after time. So um, I hope I've explained. Uh, this this part I understood, but how does the frequency get, how does the crystal get excited uh, for vibration? Oh, because so, see the crystal is, uh, goes in a crystal oscillator. Uh, Okay. Okay. It will take too much time. We'll I'll understand it later on from some time with you. With you with yeah. This. So it's already see, too much time. Okay. So um, we we are putting the voltage on the crystal resonator, right? In a crystal oscillator mm-hmm. circuit, mm-hmm. and then we get the output frequency. So basically, a, a crystal is in a in a in a circuit where a drive is given to it. When the drive is given, it starts oscillating. Yes. At that frequency, and the, there's an output frequency which which gets transmitted. Okay. 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 I'll understand it later on uh, because it's uh, it's getting too late for everybody, and there's one more uh, yeah presentation. Uh, of ours, yeah. So, yeah, we'll we'll understand it later. Thank you. You are. Uh, 
थैंक यू विशाल जी वैसे नाइस प्रेजेंटेशन थैंक यू सर आवर नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटर इज राजेश जी ओके सो यू नो आई एम शेयरिंग माय स्क्रीन एंड लेट मी नो वंस यू आर एबल टू सी इट एंड लेट मी आल्सो नो इफ आई एम क्लियरली ऑडिबल या यू आर क्लियरली वी कैन सी यू वी कैन सी यू ओके so uh, thanks uh, vishal i mean uh, you know, very very interesting subject uh, i think lot to be learned uh, but uh, we got uh, some idea uh, so i'll start with my introduction i think i'm also with the same batch as praveen and vishal 1994 but i was an mt and uh, you know i have worked in various industries uh, started my career with a machine tool from campus and then uh, uh, I, i don't know if uh, anyone have heard of a company called micromatic grinding technology so i started my career with that Uh, then uh, moved to uh, carbon dam universe which is into abrasives so i started handling first metal working fluid uh, then handled abrasives there and then after carbon dam i joined valvoline where i am actually uh, handling uh, the lube so you know i have a, a, a little varied experience in terms of machine tools abrasives metal working fluids uh, lubricants and some uh, you know allied products i worked into various uh, roles uh, you know right from servicing uh, in my first job to front line sales and business development handling key accounts product management technology now and i have also worked in uh, domestic as well as international uh, market so my assignment last assignment with carbondom was basically uh, international market and uh, as i said i started uh, working with the uh, parishu which is better known as micromatic grinding technologies today and uh, carbondom in past and i'm currently working with valvoline in comments so unlike a very uh, unique very specialized uh, topic that uh, vishal uh, just uh, took us through uh, you know it's it's less heard less talk i am going to take up a subject or a topic which is i think we all in this forum would have come across and i am going to talk about radiator coolants i think we all use this product so what i'm trying to uh, you know cover in my uh, slides is But just to set the context and a perspective, to start with functions of it, I'll get into what are the formality components of it and what are the functionalities of those components and what are the various types. So, uh, and I think by end of the session, uh, you should be able to really understand what are the parameters to look on a bottle when you buy a product and which type of product you should be buying. So that's the whole objective of my uh, presentation today. I've kept it very very simple. Uh, it's a complex, uh, uh, you know. product and technology but i have tried to keep it very very simple so that we get a overall perspective about the product okay so uh, let's understand as to you know what is the role of the coolant now uh, i'm i'm trying to uh, relate an automotive uh, basically in uh, ic engine when i'm talking to talking about the uh, radiator coolant i'm trying to relate all the aspects uh, around that so if you look at the uh, entire heat energy that is produced in a um, ic engine it's only one third that is actually utilized to convert that heat into a mechanical uh, energy and rest you know a uh, two third of the entire heat goes as waste it's basically radiated into environment through different means so it's around 7% of the heat that gets radiated uh, in environment uh uh you know through the engine itself which means the engine is a metallic component it does get hotter and as the air blows up that it radiates the heat into the environment the next piece is okay one second yeah so uh, the around 30% of the heat uh you know emits out into the uh, atmosphere through the exhaust gases and it's around 33% of the total heat produced by in the ic engine which is taken by coolant and the cool and the entire cooling system uh, works to radiate or dissipate that heat so you know it's a significant amount of heat that comes uh, directly or indirectly through in contact uh, with coolant and it you know um, uh, facilitates to dissipate it so let's understand about the significance and importance of coolant now if you look at uh, you know these are the three major components when we talk about operating an engine fuel lubricant which is engine oil typically into it and a radiator coolant these are three three component as in a consumable liquid now if you 
look at the operating cost it is basically the fuel which is the highest followed by lubricant and then by radiator coolant we always pay a good attention about the fuel we talk about the bs6 fuel we talk about the bs4 fuel fuel quality sulfur level all those things then we talk about uh, we, we do give importance to lubricant where we talk about synthetic semi synthetics you know uh, high mileage kind of a uh, formulations but when it comes to uh, radiator coolant it's a little neglected area in terms of it doesn't get that kind of a attention but in overall if you look at it is basically the entire cooling system and you know uh, and the radiator coolant is a part of the cooling system that is a major cause of overall failures and there are ample number of studies which says that coolant system failures is the number one cause of mechanical breakdown and up to 60% of the engine failures are due to improper cooling or are coolant related so that's the kind of importance this fluid carries but at times tends to get neglected so my uh, next slide will touch upon you know what are the things that we need to really look into it and then uh, you know pick and choose a product considering those aspects into it okay i think it's it the the and the the formulation and the coolant as a product is evolving and it has evolved uh, over a period of time and if you look at the earlier engines uh, you know uh, especially i don't know uh, we all would have heard or seen those vehicles which were like uh, contest and all it was a big vehicle right uh, though the engine blocks were predominantly iron they were cast iron they had larger grills which means more air could flow through it and take off the heat and radiator and cooling system very very simple they were made of iron copper and brass right so because this design was simple the heat dissipation heat generated was uh, 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 lesser the the uh, number of uh, metals involved in the entire system were few the protection needs were very very simple and uh, you know the cooling system was robust enough to take and work with a simple iot coolant i will talk about this iat in couple of uh, more slides you'll understand it's basically inorganic acid technology coolants and i will touch upon that what exactly is this but if you look at the modern uh, vehicle today uh, you know we have uh, uh, vehicles which are actually uh, more where the engines are much smaller uh, they are uh, lighter and they are more power intense and i say power intense if you look at the earlier engine the 2 liter engine will give you somewhere around 50 60 bhp power but today's uh, modern engines uh, especially if you look if i take example of a uh, ford eco sport which is 1 liter will give you 100 plus uh, power so which means the engine uh, are today more power intense and when they are more power intense they are also running hotter so the temperature that used to be somewhere around the coolant out temperature used to be uh, say around 70 80 is going up to you know touching almost 100 and the overall uh, the the bulk oil when i say bulk oil the engine oil temperature which used to be somewhere around 80 90 are today touching almost 120 130 degrees celsius so that's a quantum change in the overall heat which is gone in and the 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 systems designs have become smaller so the load on those system to handle that heat is gone exponentially high the grills are smaller which restricts the air flow and there are multiple metals which has come to keep the vehicle weight uh, lighter so there are multiple metals uh, more aluminum has come in there complex plastics coming in the gasket steels so they, they all need a unique chemistries and that's how i said the coolant formulas are getting evolved over a period of time so today's uh, requirements have become more complex and they need a very very specialized kind of a product and the older technology may not were good enough for the uh, you know primitive or the earlier vehicles may not be really good for today's cars or vehicles okay talking about the functions of course the heat uh, transfer is the main uh, function of coolant and as the word coolant says it's basically taking off dissipating the heat or transferring the heat the other function of a coolant is to protect the entire system from corrosion there are multi metals so we don't want corrosion we don't want deposits so it has to protect it from there Uh, it does help in increasing the boiling point uh, you know we we want the overall system uh, uh, the the boiling point to be higher uh, because if if the coolant tends to boil uh, the the liquid will turn into gas and it will we lose the volume of it so we 
it will call for a frequent top up or frequent addition of the coolant in the system but in case we are able to increase the boiling point we can minimize the losses uh, which uh, you know is because of liquid changing into gaseous or a vapor phase uh, we need a freeze point depression i think my friends who are in sitting in canada they know uh, you know the coolant there is called as anti freeze they they don't uh, term it as a coolant they call it an anti freeze because uh, the the temperatures are sub zero and they would want that the liquid in the cooling system should not freeze because if it freeze it will expand and will spoil the whole system so it should be a, have a very good freeze uh, point uh, depression especially in the regions which are subject to sub zero uh, uh, ambient temperatures and it should also really lubricate the pump which is pumping this uh, liquid uh, because there's nothing else uh, there's no lubricant into it there's nothing else only the liquid which is flowing through the liquid itself should be lubricating the pump so that's another uh, you know requirement or a function of a radiator coolant it should be chemically stable because the coolant is uh, you know subjected to a uh, very uh, high temperatures and very uh, then it cools down so it's a very get into a very cyclic kind of a temperature uh, conditions where it is hot cold hot cold hot cold so you know the entire formulation should be chemically stable it should not happen where the corrosion inhibitors into it starts disintegrating uh, a, a simple example to relate is like when we boil a water we always see a white precipitate or sediments because the chemicals or the salts in that becomes unstable as the temperature goes up and you cool it down so no we don't want that phenomenon to happen here in uh, coolant so that's another function of a good coolant and of course it should be compatible with multiple metals it uh, comes in contact with then the elastomers and the seals and also so there are uh, you know many functions of a coolant uh, prime is of heat transfer followed by corrosion prevention and freeze protection uh, sorry freeze point depletion in the colder regions okay so so uh, you know if you if you look at what goes into a uh, uh, coolant so let's look at first types you know by usage we can divide the define the coolants uh, in two ways it's called rtu or which is ready to use which means whatever you get in a bottle you pour into the liquid into into your cooling system or into your radiator that's it and there's a concentrate version also into market Uh, where you need to really dilute it in a, a ratio which is recommended by the manufacturer right now both has their own uh, pros and cons uh, uh, you know if if you look at rtu it's basically carrying at times you know 50 or 60% just water so the overall cost of distribution or the cost to the user goes high because you're then uh, spending money in uh, uh, spending money in uh, uh packaging it transporting it you pay taxes on just water so the cost goes up uh, so the concentrate that way becomes uh, cost effective but it always leave a risk of what kind of water is being used at the point of use because water can greatly influence the overall performance so generally the the oems where they fill the uh, coolants in their plant they buy concentrate and they they have a well controlled water available and they can dilute it in the required ratio but in a retail market you know thing i think the best product is to buy a ready to use because you are sure of that there's a water uh, which is of right quality uh, that has been used to dilute it uh, you know we are not leaving it to the mechanic who's using what sort of water we do not india as a region we see a very very uh, uh, varied water hardness across the uh, which are you know the region so there are uh, water as hard as almost 1000 ppm as well so you know we are not leaving that chance if you are buying the rt now then uh, you know we can also categorize a coolant by chemistry which is conventional iat i just talked about oat and hybrid i'm going to touch this piece in uh, you know one of the coming slide so uh, these are the basically types of the coolant and what goes into the component now when i say uh, composition i am referring here just a concentrate okay so this as a, the concentrate will have 90 to 92% of ethylene glycol and 8 to 10% of corrosion inhibitor and traces of bittering agent and the dye 
and in in next slide we will basically talk about what exactly what does ethylene glycol bring into the equivalent formulation it, it gives a very good freeze protection so wherever there is a freeze protection required we will add a glycol so in a, any solution um, which is diluted and we are using into a car and it's containing around 40% of glycol will give us almost around minus 36 or 35 degree C of freeze point. So that's that's a good freeze point and it comes because from ethylene glycol into it. Glycol also helps to slightly elevate the boiling point also of the liquid. And a very small glycol, uh, uh, you know, say around five to 10 percent is actually sufficient to keep the, uh, uh, to lubricate the uh, water pump and keep the corrosion inhibitor solubilized. I don't want uh, these corrosion inhibitor to disintegrate when the product is subject to a varied temperature. So the, the glycol helps us to keep the uh, corrosion inhibitor solubilized into it. It keeps the entire formulation very balanced. Okay. Uh, so I, I later, so coming to the corrosion inhibitor, it's the main functional element in the corrosion. So it is the it is the component which prevents the entire system from corrosion, cavitation, scaling, deposits. It also brings in the compatibility with the uh, fluid and it also provides foam control. So it is doing the exact functional element of thing. The glycol gives me only the freeze as well as the boiling, but this does the major thing. And there are three types of this uh, uh, corrosion inhibitors. Dye we add, uh, you know, we add a bittering agent to it because actually EG is a very toxic. Uh, we don't want, uh, uh, you know, if it, there is an accidental spillage and some animal actually swallows it. So uh, it's made bitter so that nobody is able, no, you know, it, no one can accidentally swallow it. So that's the function of a bittering agent. And dye is also basically to, you know, detect that there are leakages. And of course, uh, to prevent mixing of a wrong color. So there are different dye, you would have seen a green, you would have seen an orange. These days there's a transparent, which is yellow, blue, Walden, multiple colors of uh, coolants are coming these days and they're seen in the market. Okay, so this is what I said, uh, you know, in a ready to use kind of coolant, if there's around 50% glycol, it will give me a freeze point of around minus 36, a boiling point, it will elevate from 100 to 107. And actual, uh, actually the uh, boiling uh, uh, point is elevated by using a pressure cap into it. So we generally in car they use, or on a vehicle they use a 15 PSI uh, pressure cap, which takes this 107 to 129. So this is a varied component of the glycol into the formulation and what kind of freeze it gives, what kind of boiling it gets. And you know, by adding another 15 PSI pressure cap into radiator pressure cap into it, you know, this is the kind of a uh, boiling point we can take on. So this was the sub, uh, main, another aspect that I, uh, you know, had been talking about IAT, OAT and all. So what exactly is it? This is basically the chemistry into it. They are, the corrosion inhibitors are basically a combination of multiple salts into it. Now, the inorganic salts like, uh, you know, uh, borates, uh, silicates, uh, phosphates, nitrites, nitrate. So the combination of four or five things into a formulation. Now what happens is over a period of time when the product is being used, these different, uh, you know, salts into it have a tendency to deplete at a different rate, right? So there are few things which will deplete very quickly. There are few which will deplete slowly. But what happens is if this is the line where I say this should be a minimum, uh, you know, a level of uh, the uh, each ingredient, my coolant gets imbalanced when it attains around say this kind of a service life because this component has depleted below the level that I would intend it in the formulation. So as you see, the, as we use or prolong the usage of the uh, coolant into the system, the coolant becomes more and more unstable. The, uh, the formulation becomes imbalanced and it will not give me the kind of a protection that it should be giving me. So that's a limitation of IET because different uh, ingredients or different formulating components here degrade at a different uh, rate. So generally, if you look at the IETs would have a, so, uh, you know, a shorter uh, service uh, interval or service life. 
Whereas if you look at uh, OAT, OAT is nothing but this inorganic acid technology, this is an organic acid technology. And these are salts like uh, azoles, uh, carboxylates, uh, sebacic acids, those kind of things. They are pretty stable over a period of time. And I'm just mind the scale. We're talking about 25,000 kilometers or miles here. So we're talking about 250,000. So, you know, they, they, they are basically uh, stable over a longer time and give a continued protection through a much longer uh, service interval. So that's how most of the coolant in the market today are now shifting from IAT to OAT. Now, there's another product which has emerged is a hybrid. It's basically HOAT. They call it hybrid OAT. So the genesis is basically OAT only. But what we do is we add a component of inorganic into it. And why do we do that is this OAT technology has a one small brand, uh, you know, uh, uh, drawback. While these kind of a product have a very good protection start at the very instant you start using it. For example, in a new system where everything is, uh, you're putting the cooling coolant for the first time, uh, you know, they start giving you protection from that instant. So all those technologies work with the passivation. They basically passivate the metal surface and that's how they protect it. So the passivation happens here very quickly. OAT, you know, it takes some time. Now that some time could be basically a few hours to a few days. So few OEMs feel that in that initial period, you know, my system could be at risk. So what they did was, uh, that's how the hybrid came in. They add a little of this into this. Now IAT gives, gives us an instant protection. It gets depleted and then the OAT takes over. So that's how the hybrid has come. Few OEMs are okay with the OAT, but most have moved towards a hybrid kind of a technology, but the genesis is organic acid technology. So one takeaway from this slide is the product which is termed as OAT or hybrid or anything which is organic OAT or organic acid technology is designed and has a cap capability to give much, much longer uh, service life and a protection. So that's a takeaway from uh, this uh, particular slide. Okay. So, uh, you know, coming to a, a parameter, uh, coming to a, 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 you know, sort of a conclusion here because uh, I thought I'll just uh, uh, prepare something which fits within the 20 minutes of allotted time. So what we should be really looking at, you know, we should be basically looking at either I'm buying a concentrate or I'm buying an RTU. So if I'm buying a concentrate, I should be very sure of what kind of water is being added into the, along with the concentrate. And I am I or are, is the person who is adding it, is diluting it in the ratio or dilution, which is recommended. It is not under diluted or it's not over diluted. Over diluted means it's not concentrated. So that's one piece we need to really look at. Preferably is we should go with the RTU because we take off the hassle of what kind of a mixing ratio is going, what kind of water is going. We take off that piece if you use a RTU. It may be slightly pricey, but I think it's much better uh, uh, thing to do is to go with this because we eliminate all those things where there are chances of making mistakes. The other thing is on a bottle, we should, if you look at what it is talking, is it talking about a OAT hybrid or it's talking about, a, so nobody will talk about IAT, then nobody will explicitly say IAT. They will eliminate, they will avoid talking about OAT or a hybrid thing which means most likely it is IAT technology. So that's what we should be looking at. Third thing is we should be looking at a freeze protection. Now what happens is why glycol uh, for India, uh, since we are a very, uh, it's, a, it's a tropical uh, climate, we really don't need a freeze protection, right? And the glycol adds to a significant cost of the formulation. So uh, in, in, in a race to bring in a cost effective product, they are ample, I think in the 50% of the product in the market today would be just water-based. So while uh, we are okay as far as the freeze point is concerned because we don't encounter those kind of temperature, but what happens is uh, we are losing a small piece that also, that glycol also plays in terms of the solubility of the corrosion inhibitor and also lubrication of the pump. So small element of glycol is always uh, better and should be preferred. 
and how we should look at it is if if we try to uh, look at the information about the freeze protection there could be a minus 36 there could be minus uh, 24 minus 16 minus 9 but if it is saying there's no freeze protection i think that is something that we should really avoid at because then it the, the, the entire coolant formulation may become a little imbalanced because of the solubility characteristic that we lose uh, in a formulation without uh, glycol there could be products which are calling which are called as non and non antifreeze which is clearly it's a water based product all right so those are the aspects that we should look at and if you are using a constraint obviously a dilution ratio we must look at what is the dilution ratio so basically my my recommendation when you buy is to go for a rtu eliminating all the hassles of water type of water concentration dilution ratio and go for a product which has some glycol right and and the freeze point there could be an indicator whether it has a glycol or not and preferably an oa sorry it should be an an oat and a hybrid kind of a technology so i think in uh, uh, in a short duration of 20 minutes and not taking much time i thought i'll just give you some takeaways it could have sounded very very basic but uh, that's what i thought was possible uh, in this allotted time frame so in case you have any question uh, i would be happy to answer and i thought i feel or i think uh, let me know if it made uh, any sense to all of you and it was well worth your time thank you thank you rajesh uh, rajesh thanks rajesh uh, one question i had rajesh uh, sir this was a very nice presentation informative presentation uh, just to tell you that I was uh, instrumental in bringing the aluminium radiate technology into India way back in 92. Great. Sir. And, and at that time, uh, we had one issue, which was we were, we were introducing, uh, we were transitioning from copper brass radiators to um, mechanically assembled radiators. And then we moved on to uh, uh, controlled atmospheric brazing type uh, radiator technologies or heat exchanger technologies. But initially we had faced, uh, faced some issues in terms of uh, corrosion, which happened to the, uh, because the people were not used to the aluminum technology. And we had corrosion issues in the radiators uh, and uh, there were a lot of uh, warranty issues which we faced. And when we dissected the radiators which are coming back from the field, there was a lot of corrosion and uh, uh, and probably uh, it was because of uh, the people were not aware of uh, uh, the, the radiator coolant issues at that time because uh, it was new thing. Other uh, previous to that, they just used to pour water and that's it, drive on as you yes. see it, the, the contents are. Now, to tell me uh, the, the reason of uh, corrosion at that time, what we saw in aluminum radiators, mm -hmm. was it primarily because of the, the condition of uh, uh, addition of water into the, the coolant or was it uh, the, that at that time IAT was predominant and uh, we, the, the technology had not moved on to OAT and hybrid uh, AT? Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, partly you're right. Uh, that Those are the days when IAT was the, uh, you know, predominant uh, formulation here. And as you rightly said, that was a transition phase of bringing in the more of aluminium. So there are multiple, as I said, you know, the multiple component has to go. So there, there's some component which has to protect from the cast iron or the iron from corrosion. There's some component which is, has to protect uh, aluminium from the corrosion or deposit. So the formulations earlier were very, very simple. In fact, you rightly said, just water and put nitrite into it and that's it. It's, it's a cast, nitrite gives a very, very good corrosion protection for cast iron. But what we need is basically to prevent aluminum is silicates into it. So I think it could have, okay. it could, the, re, the reason could have been the formulation was very basic design for more of a cast iron and less of a, a aluminum protection that could have thing. But today, if you see, because I think everybody has moved to aluminum radiator, the silicates are uh, found very, uh, you know, uh, in the in the coolant. Yet being a IAT, so earlier IATs could be without a silicate. 
and that could have caused the corrosion because silicate okay. uh, is one which will protect the aluminium okay rajesh uh, you need the mid side uh, yes sir yeah that was a very nice presentation with very good features and the information for the domestic use also and for the automotive also i want to know uh, whether in the normal course uh, when we change the coolant मतलब आइदर टॉप ऑफ द टॉप अप ऑफ द कूलेंट इज बीइंग डन इन द मार्केट और इन द रिटेल मार्केट और द कूलेंट हैज बीन चेंज्ड हार्डली द ऑल कूलेंट हैज बीन रेंज्ड फ्रॉम द रेडिएटर एंड देन द रिप्लेसमेंट ऑफ द कूलेंट इज देयर सो इज देयर एनी चांस ऑफ गेटिंग डेटोरिएशन ऑफ द रेडिएटर परफॉर्मेंस ड्यू टू द मिक्सिंग ऑफ द कूलेंट टू टू डिफरेंट कूलेंट्स ऑफ द डिफरेंट कंपनीज i think very good uh, question uh, sandeep uh, but what i would say is uh, mixing of two coolants from two different uh, companies uh, to i'll say uh, two different technologies now you are uh, very rightly said now the modern coolants it's more of a fill for life now there are coolants uh, which are available which can which are as good as uh, giving you a service life of say 10 lakh kilometers now what happens if there are accidental uh, um, leakages and when if when we top up in the retail market that is the time when we we need to be very very careful because if i am adding a iat into it right uh, the inorganic technology which is predominantly available because they are very cheap also in the so okay. and you know the mechanic will uh, go uh, by what works best for him in terms of his incentives on his motivation mm-hmm. now if i add a inorganic technology for a certain period of time the thing will be good but as the met- components get depleted my coolant is no good again so okay. if we are topping up oat with the oat and as i said today 90% of the 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 uh, automotive cars or buses i'm not i'll not say heavy duty as of now but definitely the pass cars they are oat technology so if you're topping up oat with the oat there is no issue but if you're topping up oat with the iat we are risking the equipment after some time Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Most welcome. Uh, Rajesh, very nice presentation. Uh, Nikhil, this side. Uh, Thanks, in your sir. presentation, uh, you were not talking about uh, specific heat, and uh, one more thing that was viscosity. So, just imagine that you, I mean, this was not in the preview, or these are the parameters of viscosity and specificity. These are important. नहीं ये बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है निखिल जी लेकिन मैं उसको उतना इलाबोरेटिव नहीं बनाना चाह रहा था तो इसलिए मैंने उसको सिंपल रखा देर आर लॉट ऑफ वर्क विच गोज इन टू योर ओवरऑल स्पेसिफिक हीट बिकॉज हीट डेसिपेशन इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फंक्शन राइट सो एंड दीट डेसिपेशन ऑल्सो इज डिपेंडेंट अपॉन दी फॉर्मुलेटिंग कम्पोनेट नाउ ग्लाइक actually if you look at water is the best what has a best heat carrying capacity right but if i add a glycol into it i am actually compromising on my heat carrying capacity so there are multiple things that go into designing a product and it is a very important aspect i wanted to keep it very very simple so i didn't get into all those uh, numbers and formulas and uh, stuff like that okay and uh, one more question is there is there anything phenomena like uh, cavitation or this kind of phenomena which deteriorates the performance of uh, heat exchange yes yes uh, i think uh, one of the slide i did touch upon the uh, uh, you know the the uh, cavitation uh, there's a the pump cavitation is a biggest uh, issue the other thing is uh, liner pitting as we called it in a heavy commercial because wahan pe liners hote hain small cars mein hamara wet liners nahi hote so liner pitting is a big issue I so know. there are multiple aspects uh, there uh, i would have loved to talk all about all that but uh, nikhil it was becoming little difficult to fit everything in the window of 20 minutes so i thought i just <laughs> keep it very very crisp and short but if there is a interest we can always schedule a next uh, somewhere uh, any time and we can touch on the, all those nuances of uh, the heat and cavitations and how the cavitation happens and all those stuff Uh, definitely rajesh that was very nice presentation and everything was uh, very planned thank you thank you very much thank you so rajesh this is pravin here uh, call some like point to chia the regarding uh, corrosion when these uh, micro channel heat exchangers basically which you called radiators uh, were aluminum yeah aluminum, aluminum 
so you know uh, i'm just trying to relate you know in sometime in 2002 3 2004 um, we introduced the same technology of the heat exchanger in air conditioning industry for the condenser yes uh, yes okay? but you know unlike radiator which is roughly around 0.5 meter long our heat exchangers were roughly around 2.1 uh, meter long so so mm-hmm. there were a lot of issue in terms of uh, the uh, micro holes uh, the the pin holes you call it yeah so it used to have a pin holes you know over a period of time yes. initial round range yeah. of uh, micro yeah. channel aluminum heat exchangers so it right. used to leak from the pin holes because the thickness was not uniform across the hole correct uh, and then there was some coating which is called magnesium coating which is being uniformly distributed so that surface uh, corrosion is minimum so those were not very perfect so when uh, uh, kolsa was talking about corrosion it was a uh, external pitting or those kind of this thing or internal corrosion see the corrosion will be basically when we are referring here is all internal internal okay now uh, your issue in air conditioning is totally different and uh, i i can uh, talk about that as well because in my uh, earlier assignment i have uh, handled uh, the the forming fluids which are all uh, vol- uh, you know evaporative form and uh, form fluids which goes into your condenser uh, manufacturing the f- you know fin stampings and tube drawing and your hairpin bend joints and all those stuff so there the issue is different the, the issue there is basically the kind of a uh, see what you need in your um, uh, those kind of uh, evaporator manufacturing is a lubricating fluid which is a vanishy type which actually evaporates by itself and you don't really need to clean it to remove it now if 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 uh, if you have certain products which are used to draw it or deep draw it what happens is if there are residues when you do a brazing you know when you put uh, your hairpin bends and you put into the oven for uh, for brazing those uh, residues tend to burn and escape and at times they will cause us sort of a holes that gaseous element will during the brazing it's trying to eliminate uh, you know exit out of this whole thing that will create a um, sort of a fine potential areas of uh, weak spots where which will uh, later get into your leakages and these leakages would be more in the brazing area on your uh, hairpin bend joints and all the other thing which is in your tubes is basically because of again the kind of a chemical which is or the lube that you have used now there are certain uh, products which when you use your refrigerant into it and if there are residues they actually make a very corrosive they re- they react and make a, a localized corrosive thing and that creates your uh, basically corrosion and lead into a pinhole uh, sort of a thing so it's all to do with your lubricant that has gone in drawing those tubes or uh, stamping those tubes. basically it's a tube which gets uh, the pinholes leakages so it basically fluid used to deep draw it okay so it's a kind of very small micro blow holes which you are saying absolutely that the... is that is in the area of brazing jo aapke you uh, hairpin bends hote hain upar wahan pe jab brazing ho rahi hai tubes ke sath uski us area se leakage hai that is because of that but if it is uh, in the in the during in the length of the uh, it's somewhere in the length of the tube then it is be, it's possibly or potentially because of the kind of a uh, liquid or lubricant that was used to uh, uh, draw it so what you do is basically expand karte hai na fins ke mein laga kar ke stack kar ke tube ko dal ke usko expand kar dete hain the whole system becomes uh, um, imp- uh, you know sort of a that's how you assemble it okay no oh, i got it got it right, right. so you have a stack of fins there are two tube. types of technologies in there one yeah. is extrusion and the one another is mechanically expansion so there are two different technologies in heat exchanger manufacturing yes sir okay. so there are basically fins and there is a corrugation the two ones yeah so those are the mechanically types and yes. the extrusion yes. for the uh, the type of uh, what um, praveen was mentioning is that uh, they are micro uh, micro tubes or micro holes uh, not micro void uh, it's called micro void uh, tubes which are used in uh, through uh, or which are manufactured through extrusion process so these are different technology yeah you are right so we are talking about in our, in the air conditioning it is extrusion process yeah
Okay. So, uh, but I think Rajesh, I, I, what, I just what logic to, you just given wanted most to of differentiate. Things, yeah. Yeah. So it's, what it's Rajesh? Just differentiate. Yeah. Go ahead. So what Rajesh said, I think uh, some of the findings which we also find in similar lines. Uh, you know the 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 process of extrusion and the various uh, I think I don't know the process how this extrusion process happened when these coils you know, tubes were manufactured, but something came to that line only that there was some. Um, Maybe some blow holes, yes, very micro holes remains, yeah. and the coating surface coating has some need a very special magnesium coating so that it doesn't react. So and then if a small thing happens, in the the pinhole happens, and then the gas start leaking. So I think yeah. what you said I could relate, but of course I'm not exactly from the same level of uh, designing part of the micro channel or heat exchanger, but I think I could relate it now. Thanks a lot, Rajesh. Thank you, Paul Sir. Thanks, Praveen. Uh, any more question from participant side? Okay, thank you. Very nice presentation for today. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.